to Stacktastic, the weekly web show for the avid comic book reader and those who aspire to become so. Now, I don't know about you, but I was pretty thrilled on Friday when I got an email from DC Comics telling me that Young Justice would be back on the air the very next day. Not only was I thrilled that one of my favorite animated shows was finally returning, but I was shocked that a comic book company actually successfully updated me on news of one of their animated TV shows. Seriously, there are a few forms of entertainment that keep their viewers lost in the dark and searching for answers more than comic book animated series. It's a very strange business model, and yet somehow we all still watch. So today I'm going to share my thoughts on Season 2, Episode 36, Before the Dawn, as well as on Young Justice in general. Let's get started. I'm sure that when the producers and writers of Young Justice sat down and came up with the idea of a season-long storyline, it was a very exciting idea. Sure, the first season had plot lines that ran its entire course, but the A storyline kept changing every couple of episodes. However, Season 2, aka Invasion, was meant to bring a whole new level of sophistication to an animated series, not only by jumping forward five years in time, a la Desperate Housewives, but also by introducing this season-long storyline, which gave the Young Justice creative team ample room to tell the story with the depth and nuance of a multi-part comic book event, or television event. And it was great timing, as over on Nickelodeon, The Legend of Korra was also bringing a new level of sophistication to its own franchise and the medium. But lo and behold, while the creative side of the comic book animation industry was doing its job, the business side was not. While the three-month hiatus in the middle of Season 1 was tolerable, Season 2 took it to a whole new level. There have been not one, but two hiatuses, the reason for the second one still a mystery. And I have to say, the biggest victim of these hiatuses is not the audience, but the show itself. If an animated series wants to be like a comic book event, it must come out on time like a comic book event. Any comic book reader knows that for a title to come out late, especially an issue of a finite miniseries, can be a death knell. The only thing anyone remembers about Kevin Smith's Spider-Man Black Cat The Evil That Men Do miniseries is that it was horrifically late. And as Invasion sputters along, I fear that its scattered schedule will be all that we remember. As before the dawn got underway, I found myself suddenly bored with the mystery of these alien invaders, even as answers were revealed. I'd also have to say that Young Justice's cast might have finally reached the tipping point in terms of size. There is no real main character this episode for us to latch onto narratively or emotionally. Even Blue Beetle, who's become central to the plot, got little screen time. And a major turning point for Miss Martian was also merely skimmed over, a far cry from last season's Image episode. Then again, I might be a little biased as Miss Martian is my favorite character while I have little interest in the new Blue Beetle, a character that's never been developed much on Young Justice or the pages of DC Comics. Please note that I certainly understand the demands of a team show, but perhaps the rapidly expanding cast, coupled with the lack of effort made to define any of these new characters, is beginning to take its toll. Hopefully things will turn around with upcoming episodes, True Colors, where Robin leads a raid on LexCorp, and Fix, where Black Manta seeks vengeance against Miss Martian. That last one is a good sign, as one of my favorite things about Young Justice is that it continues to not pull its punches. So what do you think? Are you still enjoying Young Justice Invasion as much as you did at the beginning of the season, way back in April 2012? And do you like any of the new members of the team as much as the original six? Plus, with the fate of a third season still up in the air, once again, nobody is telling us anything, do you think the comic book animation industry is its own worst enemy? And now, because it's been so long, I wanted to make sure I brought back my recommendation section this week. It's a little light because the publishers are still rebounding from the holidays, but we do have some doozies. First, I'm happy to report that Superbia No. 3 is hitting shelves, and some major shit hits the fan this issue. Thank you so much to everyone who's been tweeting and Facebook messaging me about Superbia. Scott Snyder even tweeted that he's reading it, which just blew me away. Please know that all your support is tremendously appreciated, not just by me, but by artist Russell Donnerman and the entire Superbia team. Then, before we've gotten the chance to recover from Amazing Spider-Man number 700, and perhaps that's a good idea, Superior Spider-Man is also hitting shelves. Love it, hate it, doesn't matter. Everyone is going to pick up this issue, which means Dan Slott is doing his job. Some of you who have been asking me how much longer I think Dark Horse can hang on to their Star Wars titles in light of the Disney Lucas deal. My answer is that eventually I think the Star Wars titles will migrate to Marvel. But at least Dark Horse isn't going gently into that good night. Putting wood on a Star Wars title that takes place right after the destruction of the Death Star could result in a top-tier comic with major crossover appeal beyond the diehard fans. Also, I've been recommending another Brian Wood Dark Horse book for some time now, Conan, and the first trade comes out this week. If you haven't already heeded my advice, now's the perfect time with this fancy schmancy hardcover. Finally, I just have to go back a week and recommend Fiona and Cake No. 1 from Boom. 
This miniseries is based on the popular gender-switching episode of Adventure Time, but it's so much more than just a gimmick. Adventure Time storyboard artist Natasha Allegri makes a phenomenal debut here as a storyteller, her writing and art both poetic and fun. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. At least just try it. And that's this week's Stacktastic. Now usually I try to end on a lighter note, but as you might have heard, over the holidays one of the best and most prolific comic book writers in the biz, Peter David, suffered a stroke. It looks like he has a long and expensive road to recovery ahead of him, so his family is hoping comic book readers like yourself might consider buying some of his comics and novels to help him out financially. I've included a link to his website in the video description, which has more details as well as updates on his progress. We're all rooting for you, Peter.